Hello and welcome to week four of Six Christians Everyone Should Know Early Church Leaders Edition. So far in our first three weeks we have looked at Stephen, uh, the first martyr of the church, Paul, an incredible missionary and church equipper, and Barnabas, uh, the great encourager. And in week four, today, this week, we are discussing James, uh, who is an excellent example of what it likes to be a unifier, to seek unity in the church between people, between churches, uh, between different groups of people. Now, you're familiar most likely with James. He is believed to be the author of the book of James. Uh, the New Testament has three different James in it, and uh, this is one of them. This is the half brother of Jesus. Uh, now, you would think growing up with the Son of God, uh, you would recognize that, or you'd like to think that you would. Most likely, we probably wouldn't. Uh, James didn't, neither did any of his other two brothers or three sisters. Uh, they did not recognize James, uh, Jesus, as the Son of God during his earthly ministry. Uh, only Mary did, the Bible tells us about his family, which is so true. Moms always believe uh, it's the siblings, they never do, and their brothers and sisters. Uh, but James didn't uh, recognize who Jesus, who his own half-brother was, until Christ was resurrected. Uh, Jesus then appeared uh, to him. He believed. Uh, James was there at, at Pentecost. And ultimately, James became uh, quickly rose the ranks and became uh, kind of the leader in the Jerusalem church, especially once Peter was imprisoned. He rose as the leader of the church in Jerusalem, which was the hub of the Christian movement. And that's why he was in a, a real pivotal role, uh, as we're going to see through a few different passages in just a second, uh, how he sought to bring, bring unity, particularly between uh, Jewish uh, Christians, which he was leading, and uh, Gentile Christians, which Paul was uh, and Barnabas were uh, a big player in. So he, he spent a lot of time, we'll see interactions um, between these three guys um, today. So I'm excited to, to walk through the Bible with you if you have uh, a copy of it with you. Uh, if you're sitting down watching this, uh, I invite you to turn to Galatians uh, chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 6, Paul writes of um, an experience he had um, with the leaders in Jerusalem. We're going to see, uh, this is Paul's account written from uh, the account of what's taking place in this region here in, um, in the Galatian region. Uh, but we're going to see Luke's account of the same deal in, in Acts chapter 15 in just a second too of what, what happened specifically in Jerusalem. But here in Galatians chapter 2 verse 6 we see, And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seem influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised also worked through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that we should go to the Gentiles and to the circumcised, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So what's happening here is uh, right before this, people have come uh, behind Paul and are, are telling uh, the new Gentile believers, as we've talked about uh, how the gospel's expanded out of Jerusalem, out of the Jewish tradition into, uh, into the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, those that were not of the people of Israel. Uh, uh, there, there's this conflict of should you be circumcised or not to be a part of the faith. Paul is saying it's Christ alone, it's faith in Jesus that saves you, and that's it. Uh, there's people that are coming behind him in this region and saying that, that circumcision was required, that creates 
confusion, particularly with new believers. That's why it's so important to disciple new believers, as we've talked about, uh, that, that they would have a strong theological understanding, because they are, as Paul later sa- sa- or says elsewhere, you can be kind of whipped around by in the, like, as if you're flying around in the wind uh, with different theological positions. We're going to be grounded in what the Bible says, not what books say, not what influential people say. Be grounded in, uh, in the Bible. Adding circumcision or any other work to the gospel shows that Jesus is important but isn't sufficient in salvation. Yet he is. Christ is sufficient for your salvation. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to keep a list of other good works. You don't need to follow the Ten Commandments. There are lots of other good things that come out of uh, the life that are fruit of the life of a believer, particularly uh, because we are spirit, a spirit-filled people, yet anything else that's equated with Christ, that is in addition to Christ, Christ and, you need to uh, trust in Christ and do this thing to be saved. That's not the real gospel. Paul recognized that, defended that, and here in Galatians 2, he's sharing. This happened, and he, um, he went to Jerusalem. They were sent there, um, to, to tell about how God was saving Gentiles and then to, to share of, um, of this disagreement that he had with these people. We're going to get into a lot of detail on that in just a second in Acts chapter 15. Uh, but first, Paul, Paul's showing here that there's two different mission fields in this time. Um, he, he and Barnabas are, uh, are working with Gentiles, but he introduces Paul or Peter, James, and John, who he says are are working with the circumcised. They're working with the Jews. He uh, is a Jew, but he has left the Jews to to go reach the Gentiles, and for all people to call on the name of the Lord for salvation. Some people have to go. We can't just stay here uh, for. For the gospel to reach the ends of the earth, to go all over these United States, to go over uh, all the countries in this world, people have got to, to cross cultures to, cultures, to cross oceans, to leave the comforts of home where their family has always lived, to, to leave their mother and father and, and go to the nations. And, and I do want to ask, are, are you where God has called you to be? Because this is a struggle in the contemporary church that we are a part of right now. Uh, it, it's a struggle for believers to leave their comfort zone, um, to do hard things, to go to hard places. It's honestly hard to, for some to go on a mission trip, let alone to, to move, to leave everything behind and join the missionary workforce. And if you are where God has called you to be, what role are you playing in taking the gospel to the nations? Because you do have a responsibility to advance the Great Commission, certainly where you are rooted right now, uh, but, but around the world. That could be done in a lot of ways, short-term mission trips. Um, that could be done through partnering with, directly with missionaries to pray for them, to encourage them, to support them. That could be done through giving to your local church. If you're a member of Buck Run, when you give to to Buck Run, we are funding multiple church plants, multiple missionaries, supporting missions agencies, uh, specific initiatives that come up that can, can assist missionaries in advancing the gospel in unreached places. You can give directly to, uh, directly through Buck Run to certain missionaries. You can give directly to missionaries. You should regularly be praying. Should be talked about in your home. You can uh, have phone calls with the, with with missionaries. You can adopt kids in other countries uh, through uh, so that they have food and education. Uh, you could uh, adopt a child, an international child, into your home uh, to be a permanent member of of your family. There are a lot of ways that you can take the gospel to the nations. Are you doing that? Uh, James uh, was rooted in Jerusalem. That was his mission field and, and lots and lots of people. He was very evangelistic. Lots of people come to, uh, come to faith there in Jerusalem. Paul is working elsewhere. He and Barnabas are, are going on missionary journeys. We, wherever you are, you should be evangelistic. You should be proclaiming with your mouth, audibly saying uh, the gospel to other people um, so that they might be saved. 
um, we see that uh, that he Paul recognizes uh, James as an important person. He calls him a pillar. Uh, and this is where we begin uh, today to hear about James. He's the leader of the church. His opinion matters. His voice matters. So he's given credence to to Paul when he extends the right hand of fellowship. Um, he's supporting him taking the gospel to the Gentiles. That was still a contested deal. Hopefully, it is not controversial that, that you hear me saying we should take the gospel to the nations. Um, that is for some. I don't think that it will be for anyone that's listening to something here at Buck Run. The gospel is for all people, all races, all ethnicities, all cultures, um, for all socioeconomic statuses. The gospel is for all people. That was not necessarily the, uh, the belief during this day. If we turn to Acts chapter, turn back to Acts chapter 15, uh, we, we see the Jerusalem council. Um, and we, we see the account of when Paul and Barnabas um, go to, to Jerusalem to settle this matter over circumcision and uncircumcision. Um, and we're going to begin in, in Acts chapter 15, reading in verse 1. But some men came down from Judea, and we're teaching the brothers that unless you're uncircumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Again, that is not the gospel. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that my mouth, the Gentiles, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now therefore... Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how first, how God first visited the Gentiles to take them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For, for ancient, from ancient generations, Moses had in every city those who proclaim him free. For he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, to choose from them, choose from among them, and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter: The brothers, both the apostles and the elder, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings, since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, though we gave them no instructions, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men 
and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by the word of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. You abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. All right, long passage. Uh, it's, it's really important. It's a lot more detailed than what was uh, found in Galatians. Um, as, as Luke writes, Paul and Barnabas, again, are, they're in Antioch. Um, and some come telling the Gentile believers that, that they should be circumcised. Paul recognizes the importance of not elevating extra-biblical requirements to the gospel. There is the gospel, and then there are second-tier issues, and third-tier, and so on. There is nothing that is as significant in one's salvation as trusting in the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's through Jesus' sacrifice, the faith in him as he conquered death, that saves a person. Nothing else and that was a big shift, understandably, from those who had grown up under the law. Because prior to Christ, there was a sacrificial system, the, the law of Moses. And it was to be followed. And as Peter pointed out, no one lived up to it. That's why they were continually making sacrifices and trying to atone for their sins. That is a big shift. Um, and it, it, I, again, it's really understandable. Sometimes I think we read the Bible. I know I read the Bible, and I'm like, how could you not understand this? Uh, well, I, when you put your, yourself in their shoes, I think it's really easy to understand. Why, well, they thought they were doing a good thing. They had even recognized Jesus, but thought they still had to do the old things. Uh, and yet when we, when we think about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, mainly the Old Testament and the New Testament, we, all of God's Word is true and applicable to us. And it's true and applicable to them. Uh, but it's, it's what Christ says, what we hold to as law, as what we must do. When we look at the Old Testament, we, we only pull what Christ has brought from the Old to the New. That doesn't mean it's not good things to follow. Uh, we don't keep a literal Sabbath. We, I don't believe that Christ calls us to keep a literal Sabbath. He, he says, you know, if there's a need to meet it, even on the Sabbath. Uh, like that's an example. There are there are lots. Um, Christ elevated the uh, many of the Ten Commandments. He said it's not good this that you murder. If you if you think an angry thought, you are a murderer. Uh, if it's not good that you would just not commit adultery. If you have those type of thoughts, you have done so. Um, he he raises the bar in this, and they're still fleshing this out. And that's why ultimately Paul and Barnabas are sent. They get in this heated, heated debate, <laughs> and then they decide uh, they're going to go to Jerusalem to meet with the leaders there, and this is where we have the first church council. Now, church councils are things that, that happened in the, in the early church, and they uh, were meetings with the leaders of the church where they would usually basically figure out what was heresy and what was not. Uh, they would issue creeds, statements of faith. Um, they would try to give clarity for everyone on what was true doctrine, what really was biblical, what was honoring to the Lord. And that's what's happening here at the First Council. And James, who we're looking at this week, is per, as the leader of the Jerusalem church, is presiding over this. And multiple people get to speak at this council, but James, as the, the guy in charge, speaks last. And I think he speaks with, with real clarity. But it's not only that he uses his wisdom, his experience, uh, his position, uh, positional authority um, to kind of set the record straight. Uh, it's really important to recognize that he uses scripture. And that's how you can, can tell what's real and what's not. Ultimately, we need to go to the true word of God. Uh, we don't just want to rely on our, our past beliefs, on our, uh, like they were doing their traditions. They used when we say traditions for them, that's a lot stronger word than when we say traditions. Um, but we, even so, we don't want to rely on past things. Uh, we, want, we want to look to the Word of God to see what's true. Uh, what does God actually say? We, like many of these Jews, add a lot of things. We think there's a certain way that a Christian should act. 
And, and a lot of times that's more narrow than what uh, the Bible says. We might think that there's a certain political perspective that people should have, that there are certain issues that people should think a certain way on. Um, and there might be the bulk of Christians that do think that way, yet there are a lot of times liberty on, on how we act and view things, what we eat and drink of. Uh, the Bible is often not as rigid in some areas as we make it out to be. And in the same stroop, the Bible is honestly provides a lot narrower path on some things, and we like to widen it out. Uh, I think we do that particularly through coarse joking, uh, what we, um, the way we talk to one another, uh, the, way, the way we live out our lives are often not in line with scriptures, whether we, we make things rise to the level of the biblical standard when it's not, or we diminish what the Bible says we should think or do in a certain way. We need to be very careful of that. Now, James recognizes this tension. Uh, this is a common, the circumcision deal is a big deal. It keeps coming up. Um, and it's, it's starting to come to a head. That's why they've had this council. Uh, and he, and he uh, you, again, uses scripture. He's quoting from the book of Amos, from uh, the prophet Isaiah. Uh, he um, not just, again, is leaning on his authority, but the authority of God through his word to, to speak to this issue. Um, and he, he shows how God is desiring to save the Gentiles. So this is a good thing that Paul and Barnabas and others are taking the gospel. It's a good thing that Gentiles are putting their faith in Christ. And there's nothing that says that they have to be circumcised. Because it is in Christ. It's the grace of Christ. When we put our faith in him, that leads to salvation. Nothing else. Yet, James wants there to be unity. He doesn't just say, this is how it is. Deal with it. He seeks to, to take it a step further. He clearly lays out what the Bible says on the issue. But he does want there to be peace in the church. The peace between all believers. Ultimately, for the sake of the spread of the kingdom. The gospel spreading like wildfire during this time. He does not, as, as the leader of the Jerusalem church, he has a responsibility to shepherd that, to keep that momentum going, and to not let infighting be the reason that the gospel is impeded from advancing to new people, to new regions, um, regardless of whether they are Jews or Gentiles. So, he, he proposes to the council that uh, they, they write the Gentiles a letter, a uh, really nice letter, <laughs> um, and they uh, they say that there's there's four Jewish ritual requirements that they ask the the Gentiles to follow. Um, that being uh, that they that you abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols, from blood, what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. Uh, they he calls on them to to keep these four rituals, not because they have to for the gospel. Uh, it's faith in Christ. These are good things, though. <laughs> um, but that they might keep these so that they would have influence with Jewish Christians, so that the Gentiles would still be able to, to win Jews to Christ, that they would not offend other people. Uh, he recognizes that now the gospel has gone from Jews to Gentiles, and it can go Gentiles back to Jews that all people need to be reached. They have not reached all of the Jews, thus they need the help of the Gentiles to then reach the Jews. So if they, the Gentiles, would keep uh, these four rituals, uh, it would, it would get put them, can continue to keep them in a position that they might have an opportunity to spread the gospel effectively in winning Jews to Christ. Again, James is a great unifier here. He's a great leader. Um, he sees division. Uh, he speaks truth. But that doesn't mean he cast out the people that were wrong. He seeks to, to meet them, not necessarily in the middle. Uh, that's not always how that works. Uh, but he does, he does things. He's like, hey, you're right. But why don't you prefer your brother and sisters here? Um, you don't have to be circumcised. Um, they don't have to be circumcised. But, hey, why don't you do this for, in deference to these other people? That's what unity is about. Unity is not always being right, and then no matter what, I'm um, not giving in to anybody. You, you can have truth. There is real truth. You should always keep the truth. 
That doesn't mean you don't have the opportunity to prefer others within that. Not sacrificing any truth, but doing, doing things in a way that love and bring others along with you. Uh, James is an incredible example of that. Uh, turn a few pages in your Bible to Acts chapter 21, where we see another op- opportunity for, for Paul, another occurrence of Paul having to go to, to Jerusalem and meet with James and the leaders in Acts chapter 21, verse 17. Um, When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, uh, Paul does his normal deal. He related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, They glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? They are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they might shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what you have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and of what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took them in that next day, purified himself along with them, and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification will be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Again, Paul finds himself at odds with uh, some Jews. So in the council, they're sharing, hey, lots of, lots of Jews are coming to faith in Christ. And word has gotten out uh, that you, about you, and it's not all good. Uh, we... We hear the good things that God's doing um, uh, in, um, with Gentiles through you, yet we've got some trouble. Now, Paul recognized that there is trouble. He had actually come bringing basically a peace offering. So the Gentile churches um, had collected an offering, um, and they wanted to help Jewish Christians. Paul was bringing this offering He was hoping that this, as the divide continued to grow between Jewish and Gentile Christians, that that showing like, hey, we care for you, we love you, that that might help smooth things over, might close that divide a little bit. Um, That's why Paul's here. That's why he goes. Again, he always starts with showing what God's done. Hey, he's saving all these Gentiles through our work. And and James and the other leaders are praising him, and they offer that thing that you never want to hear, though, when someone's lauding all that praise on you. Hey, you're doing a great job. That's awesome what God's doing. However, all these people are coming to to faith here, all these Jews, and they know about you, and they think it's being said that that you're you're telling them not to circumcise their kids, uh, not to... Not to follow the law. It's being said that you, a Jew, aren't even following the Jewish law anymore. Now, uh, James doesn't approve of the complaints. He doesn't say whether they're true or not. That's not the point. For him, it's, hey, we need unity. James always seeks out unity. We know we're stronger when we're together. When we're divided, when we're wasting our time fighting and debating with each other. And this is true of us. If you're wasting your time arguing with people on Facebook or uh, talking with other people about other people or uh, like always fighting at whatever level, whether it's a big deal or even a small deal, if it's just bickering, we're wasting time doing that. We're not strengthening our relationships with one another. We're not strengthening our relationship with the Lord. We're not missional like we could be. We're not using our time as well as we could. Time resources, energy. These are all precious commodities that Christians have. Uh, and we need to use those diligently and wisely, prudently for the advancement of the gospel. That's what James sees. James is an incredible church leader. He does not, this is a big deal. It's got, I just tell you as a leader, when the same thing comes up over and over and over in the church, it's like so frustrating. 
It's like, haven't we? Haven't we already dealt with this? And yet he, he continues to shepherd the situation well. So he comes up again with a plan. He doesn't say, Paul, you've done anything wrong. But he calls Paul. He speaks. And this is Paul, who's a pretty bold guy. If you, you know, Paul is honestly kind of hard-headed, I think. Um, he's a very strong guy. And yet James is able to, to speak to him multiple times and, and get him to, um, to give in for the love of others, which does show the character of Paul, that he, while he is a strong and proud guy, he loves others, he desires relationship with other people, um, and he, uh, he submits to authority. And at this, uh, in addition to, to the Lord, he submits to James's leadership here. So James proposes uh, this plan. There's four guys that are taking the Nazarite vow, and he calls for Paul to, that's a 30-day process. He calls for Paul to, to purify himself along with these guys at, as they're finishing up this vow. And at the end of the Nazarite vow, there's a lot of sacrifices required. And it's, you have to have unblemished animals, really fine animals. Um, and that's costly. So he's like, Paul, Purify yourself with these guys, that it shows that you're affirming uh, the rituals that they're doing, the Jewish tradition that they're keeping, and then pay for it. Um, that lets these guys finish that out, it takes the burden off of them, and it's showing that you're affirming um, Jewish traditions. It doesn't go against Paul's convictions, so Paul uh, willfully um, follows James' requests and directions so that he could... Um, he could show that he does love the Jews. That, that helps his ministry. Uh, that helps push back all the opposition that keeps coming towards Paul. It does keep coming even after this. Uh, he's arrested soon. <laughs> but, but it does show that he's trying. He's trying to, to build bridges, to build partnerships, so that they can continue to advance the gospel. Again, he doesn't do anything that goes against his convictions. Uh, I think it's really important for us to know what are true convictions and what are preferences in our life. What are things we think are good and what are things that we must do. Um, what are good things that we must keep. So Paul does that and it goes a long way towards showing uh, just like James planned it out. That's what he thought would happen. It shows um, what Paul thinks. It gives Paul more credibility. Um, James, again, does a good job of unifying people together. But let's look at Paul here. What, what change, what would you change uh, in your life? What should you change for the sake of, of reaching other people? Are there changes in your life, things that you should do different? Uh, behaviors you have, tendencies you have, the way you talk, um, the way you keep things, uh, one of our pastors, Chris Parrish, uh, you should look this up on YouTube if you didn't see it, but um, he, he preached, I think, the beginning of this year, 1 Corinthians 13, on what loving our neighbor looks like. And he used a simple example um, to try to not be controversial over if you're really wanting to connect with this family, you're wanting to, to reach this family with the gospel or love this, this family, and they are Sabbatarians. They, you just can't take them, they do not think Cracker Barrel should be open on Sundays. Why? It would be offensive to them, even though you have good intentions to, to love and spend time with them, it would be offensive to them to then take them to Cracker Barrel if you know it. So instead, go through the effort of inviting them into your home. You know, that might mean that you have to clean your home up. That might mean you have to prepare food. You have to, to buy food and have them into your home. Do that because you love them. Don't offend them uh, by taking. Should, can Cracker Barrel be open on Sunday? Yeah, it's fine. The Bible doesn't say it can't happen. Um, but that doesn't, just because you might be right, doesn't mean you can't prefer them for the sake of, of either the gospel or loving them. Uh, trying to build a relationship for them. What should you change in your life for the sake of other people? Uh, whether to keep unity in the church or to reach others for the gospel, we all have things that we should give up. We stake a lot of flags in the ground. Like This is the most important thing. And we just like run out of flags. We got to go get some more. Like We just constantly have all these things like, the church has to do this. The church has to do this. 
you're not a real believer. You're not a Bible-believing believer if you don't do this. And oftentimes, those are things that are not found in Scripture. We add things. We say we don't. It's Christ above all. Uh, this is what really matters. But our life doesn't always show that. So, and then, like James, do you work to strengthen relationships with others? Do you pursue uh, unity and, and solid relationships in your own life? And do you see opportunities to, to bring more people together, whether they're in conflict or not? Uh, there's uh, uh, an Equipping room Women uh, online recently uh, event that I uh, talked about the relationship of friendships and how one way you can have help people make friendships is to bring different friends together, to have multiple families into your home, uh, have different people together to, to try to build up more relationships in the church. Uh, that is uh, what James would do. That's what James did. He sought to bring more people into the fold. He didn't seek to, to divide people over things that were not gospel-related. Even, even people that were trying to elevate circumcision with the gospel, he fought hard to teach them the truth, to not push them out if he didn't have to. But hey, you're wrong, but come on, we can do this. Hey, why don't you do this to, to love them, to show that you do care. Uh, you just know, you recognize that that's not the gospel. Uh, but let's, let's bring them. Help me win them over. Uh, build bridges. Be a unifier. You you like people that unify. You don't like people that bring conflict into your life. Uh, you don't like, honestly, people that, that are always either at church, in your family, at work. And, you know, if they're always just stirring up trouble, that gets ex that's exhausting to be around. That's got to be exhausting to, do, to be that person. It's just tiring to be around that. There's no joy in that. There's no love of other people. You're not experiencing what the goodness of, of Christ, what freedom in Christ, what life in the Holy Spirit looks like when you're just a curmudgeon, always uh, causing trouble. Uh, so seek to be a person, one that doesn't create conflict, but not just that. Go further than that. Uh, seek to build bridges and bring people together. When you think of James, think of someone that loves other people and then helps other people love other people. Um, you can be that. And your first step might be to show other people that you care about them. But once you get there, or if you're already there, begin to help other people care about other people. Lead other people in that. Walk alongside them. And you will be like the early church leader, James. And that is certainly a Christian that everyone should know.